Awesome, we're good to go.
this one. Hi everyone, 
Welcome to the last session of today. So we start with Grace Olivier, who will talk about re resolved metallicity and stellar population maps at Redshift 1 to 2, implications for stellar models. Hello, everyone. OK, cool. I got the mic on. Excellent. Um, hi, I am Grace Olivier. I am a postdoc at Texas A&M University. Today, I'm going to talk to you about resolved metallicity maps and stellar, stellar population maps. That was a really ambitious title when I submitted my abstract. Just FYI, you'll see a little. We'll, we'll get to a little bit of them. <laughs> um, but this is work I've done with the templates team. Um, so templates is an ERS program. I'll talk to you a little bit about. But primarily, this work is work I've done with Justin Spilker, Jack Bergen, Brian Welch, who's back in the back, frantically writing things, um, Taylor Hutchison, Jane Rigby, and the rest of the templates team. So uh, I'm very happy to go this late into the afternoon when we've already had a million talks about metallicity and how you measure that. Uh, but here's my brief rundown for you. Uh, there's a couple of ways that we measure metallicity in galaxies. Um, uh, and so these are some of the Curdy 2020 relations that uh, Ryan was talking about um, in some of the previous, previous talks. Uh, these are strong line calibrators. Um, so you have log R23, which is that oxygen 2,3, um, along with the H beta. Um, then there's also N2H alpha. And so these are all strong line ratios that you um, calibrate off of direct temperature metallicities. Um, so this is when you get the auroral lines, and this is our gold standard of metallicity uh, measurements. And so these are the different ways we measure metallicities. Um, it's awesome that we have these calibrations. Um, however, as we were saying, uh, these are all calibrated to entire galaxies. Um, so this is, these are galaxies that have the 4363 auroral line for O3 detection. And then these are um, more normal star forming galaxies. Uh, at the higher metallicities. And all of these are excellent, but this is sort of from a population of galaxies and from an entire galaxy. So maybe uh, your, your um, physical conditions in regions of a galaxy might differ, so it might be difficult to use these, just foreshadowing if you're trying to do resolved metallicity mapping. Um, so, but we do know there's structure in galaxies, Bethan told us excellently the, uh, this, morning, this afternoon, um, that we do have a lot of structure. Galaxies are not like homogenous, nice uh, things that we, we can treat as spheres and disks. Um, in local galaxies, we see a lot of metallicity trends, where you have higher metallicity in the center of a disk galaxy that goes down to uh, lower metallicity at the edges. But we have seen at higher redshifts that sometimes you even have positive metallicity trends. Um, and so you have lower metallicity in the center, and you go up as you go outwards. Um, but it's a question of how well all of these things work, and how galaxy evolution no, oh, and chemical evolution changes and I'll just bring it from, uh, from Z of zero to zero two. No, but the thing is also, like, even if I do that, then so, I have to, like, it's gonna be, I was going to take an Uber with a bunch of people. Yeah, if you're online, could you please mute? Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So we'll, we'll keep moving. Uh, so this is th uh, the work I'm trying to do is to understand galaxy uh, metallicity relationships, um, how those things, how galaxies go from possibly having a, a gradient of a positive gradient at z of two to a gradient, a negative gradient at z of zero. We have uh, star forming galaxies at different epochs of of the universe. We have z of, zero, z of 1, z of 2, z of 3, and z of 4. These are four lensed galaxies. And we're observing them with the templates program. So templates stands for, hold on, let me read it, targeting extremely ma magnified panchromatic lensed arcs and their extended star formation. Um, so this is an ERS program from, from JWST. Um, and so we have amazing resolution data of all of these galaxies. Um, but the only one I'm going to talk to you about is this one on the left. <laughs> this is the Z of 1 galaxy. Um, this is J1723. You can see the critical curve as this red line over here, which I'm just showing you so that you know that there, there is a, a mirror point in between this arc. Um, so this is our arc from the NIRCAM data uh, that we have from JWST. And then the green boxes are the near-spec IFU pointings. So amazingly, this galaxy fits on one uh, tile of the near spec IFU. So that means we can measure H alpha uh, and N2 for every pixel of this galaxy. Um, so you can see this is color co coded by um, 
by the signal to noise. And so in every pixel, you have the bright H alpha and then the baby little M2s on the sides. Um, so this, I think this color map goes something like zero, 5 to 80 uh, for signal to noise. Um, so these are amazingly well um, detected emission lines from, from 1723. And when we take that information, uh, we can look at the flux map. We have these bright star forming clumps on the ends um, where the H alpha is brightest. When we look at the, um, the velocity map, uh, we're not seeing a, a huge signature for outflows or anything. We're actually seeing rotation um, along the galaxy. And I can't show you what this would actually look like because we haven't gotten that far in our lens modeling yet. So uh, this is, you'll just have to live with our um, image plane arc um, that we're seeing. So there's not a huge, um, uh, anything looking like outflows going on here. Um, but what we really want is metallicity, which means we need to look for oxygen 4363, this uh, auroral line. And we, do, we are able to measure it throughout the center of this arc. And so you'll see this is H gamma, and then over here we have oxygen 4363. And it is detected through pretty much the entire center of the arc. This is on the same um, signal to noise scale as the H alpha, so that's why it looks less impressive in this color, color map, but it's still there. Um, so when we take all of those emission lines and we put them together, we can start to get direct metallicities from the auroral oxygen lines. And that what we get for this map is we have uh, the highest metallicity um, uh, pixels that we have are actually more correlated. Uh, they're showing up inside the star forming regions that we saw. Um, and then uh, towards the center where we had some older clumps, those were redder in the near cam, uh, we have actually older, uh, less metal rich uh, gas. I will ask you to ignore this little dark outline around the thing. I have some binning issues I'm still fixing. Um, but this is what we get with the direct temperature metallicity. Um, and then uh, if you use some of these other uh, strong line relationships, um, like the Curdy 2020 N2 uh, versus a Merino 13 N2, you get entirely different maps <laughs> that look very different based on which tracer you use. In fact, S2 has metal poor clumps instead of metal rich clumps. Um, so it's really dangerous maybe to start doing resolved metallicity mapping um, if your physical conditions might not actually match what the, those uh, uh, calibrations are tracing. Uh, and just to show this a little more clearly, here is a violin plot of the spread that we get from the direct metallicity versus all of the uh, other tracers that we saw. This is preliminary, error bars may change um, as we go through with finishing up this analysis. But as you can see, things like the O3, O3N2 um, calibration, you get very flat maps. There's essentially no change in metallicity, whereas we see a significant change in the direct metallicity. So these are the metallicity maps I was telling you about. I did promise you a little bit of stellar population mapping, so we'll take a quick look at what we plan to do. Um, so for the stellar populations, we also have KCWI data um, of these galaxies, which gets us rest frame UV. With the rest frame UV, we can uh, fit a stellar population that is um, fit to the little uh, photosphere and wind features that we have in models from BPASS or Starburst 99. And we can fit a stellar population to, these, uh, to each spaxel of this image. So we can also eventually turn our KCWI image into uh, stellar populations that have an age and a metallicity um, correlated to them, which is excellent, because then we can also use that in combination with our metallicity mapping to try and understand whether or not we have the stellar populations that are capable of reproducing the emission lines that we see out of the, 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 the JWST, the rest frame optical. So this is where we do some photoionization modeling. Um, here I have uh, laid out what the observed uh, line ratios are on this map. These are line ratios versus log u. So we have a measure of the ionization and then, um, and then the, law, the actual lines that we're seeing. Um, so for each of the, these, we'll be able to do a, set, a suite of emission lines from the JWST and from the KCWI. And then we can uh, go through and fit the best fit model. And hopefully, 
are cloudy, uh, which we have tailored specifically to each pixel, we'll be able to reproduce the emission lines that we're seeing in the JWST based on the uh, KCWI rest frame UV. So this is a test of both the stellar models in the way that Grace Telford was doing with LEOP. Um, we are trying to test the stellar population in each pixel against the emission lines that we're seeing. Um, but additionally, if the, that doesn't work, this ends up being a test of what ionizing populations are there. Um, so we've done this on some previous uh, EELG dwarf galaxies in the nearby universe and found some extreme emission lines are not reproducible by stellar populations. Uh, but for this galaxy, we're looking to mostly just test that the stellar populations we're seeing at Z of 1 are still, like, our stellar models still work at Z of 1 in the way that we are mo using them to model galaxies uh, moving forward. Uh, I think that's basically everything I have, so I'll go to my conclusions. I'll leave you with a map of my direct uh, temperature and metallicity here. Um, so we're really entering this age where JWST is unlocking the ability to do the science we've been doing at local, um, with local galaxies in the nearby universe at higher redshift. Um, so it's interesting <laughs> so far, we've been, I've been sort of stuck with the JWST trying to just get a functional metallicity map, uh, which we seem to basically have at this point. And it's telling us actually that our star forming regions are, are more metal rich parts of the galaxy, which maybe not what we were expecting right, off the, right out of the gate. Um, but we'll soon be at this point where we'll be able to combine the KCWI and the JWST to understand the stellar populations and the stellar feedback by using f things like photoionization modeling to understand uh, how these things, uh, how if, wow, hold on, this sentence got really bad. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see uh, if the stellar populations are capable of reproducing that emission line pattern um, that we're seeing out of the JWST, which probably, uh, it looks like this galaxy won't break the universe and our stellar models, uh, but not all galaxies have this, uh, uh, ex it's, it's not the most extreme of the galaxies that we see. Um, hopefully this just is a good test of our stellar population models, uh, just like Grace found with the uh, LEOP, hopefully we are finding stellar models that reproduce emission lines. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, any questions? Oh, we have lots of questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, is, I just want to clarify that you had uh, this arc uh, has a mirror. Yes. And is this a half of that or it has a full arc? And have you actually, are they consistent with uh, this mirror? That's case? an excellent question. So this is so basically, the critical curve comes right through here, and so this half should be a mirror of this half. Um, and so far, this is okay. Uh, this is gets okay. This looks a little different on the very top than it does on the bottom because this is hitting right up against the edge of the image, and so some of our signal to noise has actually been clipped off, and that's why this is looking a little different. So, yeah, I do trust this uh, this mirror that's actually happening here. <laughs> So the, comparing your uh, gas phase metallicity to the stellar population metallicity, I, I noticed the stellar population is only 10% uh, of solar, while gas metallicity is just sub-solar. Yes. So the, the stellar metallicity is, I would say this is still a very, this was a very fast thing I did, also says preliminary, because I did this very quickly, like in the last week. Um, so I would say this probably needs to fit a little better um, for the stellar population. I think uh, that like I'm really missing some of the P-Signy profile on the carbon-4 and things like that. So this metallicity might actually change. Um, so I, I don't expect it's probably actually 13% solar. So up, I'm, I'm thinking because this is before the supernova Oka, it's 3, mi 3 million years. Yeah. So I, ex I ex expect that these values are similar to the gas phase metallicity. Yeah, I expect, so at Z of 1, I don't think there's going to be too much change between the, the gas phase metallicity and the uh, stellar metallicity. Um, this might be a little bit sub what we're seeing from the gas, but I'm not. I'm not expecting. I will expect this one to go up a little bit. Hi. Um, thanks for the really cool talk. Um, I am going to ask a question, which you will know after my talk. Why I'm asking this? Have you tried um, 
uh, using uh, the spatially resolved metallicity to get the metallicity gradient after uh, source plane reconstruction? Right, so that's the, sorry, I kind of missed miss saying that. That's the goal, um, and one of the things, but right now we are waiting on source plane reconstruction because uh, our lens modeling has not gotten to that point right now. Um, but that is, we're hoping to have a good um, measurement of, of a gradient through this at Z of one, so we can kind of put a nice spatially resolved JWST marker on the how gradients evolve. I'd be really interested to see that. Thank you. We're getting there. <laughs> On on to the next speaker, so let's thank uh, Grace again. So our next speaker is Ryan Sanders. He will talk about temperature-based gas phase abundance patterns at cosmic noon from uh, near spe spectrum. Uh, what's oh <laughs> okay hopefully that will stay now sneak peek what am, oh no okay uh, should it should I do it differently yeah I don't I usually do it in PowerPoint I uploaded a PDF so I thought it'd be easier that was a, clearly not the case okay um, Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to talk to you about uh, using JWST to study the physical conditions in H2 regions and the chemical abundances in the ionized gas in high redshift galaxies in the same way that we do for local sources using the same tried and true nebular astrophysics that we've applied in nearby galaxies. And the sensitivity of JWST, JWST near spec can really allow us to do this at high redshift for the first time. So we've had lots of introduction. I don't need to go through this stuff that much. Metallicities can probe the baryon cycle, the formation of galaxies, feedback, and outflows. We've seen that in the local universe. And with samples at high redshift, for example, from Keck MOSFIRE, this is work from a few years ago, pre-JWST, uh, we now have a spectra of thousands of galaxies at redshift greater than two that have suitable spectra to infer metallicities if you have the right tools to convert those line ratios into metallicities accurately. So we've done this, we can get inferences on things like mass loading factors, but it's ultimately only as good as the calibrations that we have to make these conversions. And pre-JWST, no metallicity calibrations are directly based on observations of high redshift galaxies. We use analogs, we use models, but we need to make that step directly at high redshift. And then we can also think about moving beyond just the oxygen abundance that we often focus on and talking about the abundance pattern in multiple elements, which have enrichment channels that come from stars of different masses, and so they're enriched on different time scales. And you have the potential of measuring the abundance pattern of a galaxy to make inferences about the formation history of that galaxy. So a really simple uh, demonstration of this is just a single population starburst at time t equals zero. And you can see how the abundance of various elements relative to oxygen uh, vary over time. Uh, you get an abundance pattern at short time scales from essentially pure core collapse supernova enrichment. This is things that would have low abundances of iron, carbon, nitrogen, for example. You can see neon over oxygen is flat because they're both predominantly produced by these. Uh, when you have AGB enrichment, you see that nitrogen and later on carbon uh, increase relative to oxygen. And then on line, long time scales, you get contributions from type 1As, iron goes up, but also things we're not used to thinking of as type 1A products have significant contributions from type 1A. So things like sulfur, argon, silicon have this slow rise at late times from type 1A enrichment. So you can learn about formation timescales, formation histories through abundance patterns. 
uh, but also feedback and outflows. Um, so work from Danielle and also from uh, Fiorenzo Vincenzo uh, have shown that producing the carbon over oxygen versus oxygen abundance relations in the nearby universe requires not only uh, these, these yields from our models, but also uh, outflows that carry away preferentially core collapse supernova products uh, that occur after each excessive burst of star formation in galaxies. So formation histories, but also the effect of feedback and outflows gets imprinted in the abundance patterns that we see. So to address both these questions, we need deep spectra to measure these faint temperature sensitive auroral lines that many people have been talking about, so I don't need to introduce. But of course, JWC almost immediately showed us its, its ability to measure these with the ERO data where we saw O34363 at redshift seven. Amazing, totally blew my mind. But what if we take a spectrograph with this sensitivity, and instead of pointing it at the faint high redshift galaxies and the epoch of ionization, we point it at bright cosmic noon galaxies, where we can take very deep spectra of bright sources to get an incredible amount of detail rivaling the amount of detail we have in spectra of local sources, local H2 regions, local star forming galaxies. And so that's something we've done with the Cycle 1 program led by myself and Alice Shapley called the Aurora Program. I'll save you reading the acronym because it's kind of, you know, tortured as these things are. Uh, but this is essentially a program that had two pointings, one in Goods North and one in Cosmos, where each one we have 24 hour on source exposures on cosmic noon sources that's broken down into 12 hours in the G140M grading, eight hours in G235M and four hours in G395M. It gives continuous one to five micron spectra with an almost even flat sensitivity across that entire range. And so this is a really powerful general use spectroscopic data set for a lot of different science. Um, and some of our marquee things are direct gas phase metallicities, abundance patterns, and recalibrating these strong line relations for use at high redshift. We have a fantastic team, uh, some of which are here today, um, that, that have made this possible. So it's cycle one, but we only got the data three months ago, because apparently cycle one is still going on in 2024. Um, so we had two pointings, one in Cosmos, one in Goods North. Um, they're both now covered by a full suite of GWC NIRCAM data from Jades as well as Primer. And we targeted 102 sources, about 50 sources on each mask. Uh, about a third of these were galaxies we our primary targets where we thought we had a very high probability of detecting auroral emission lines, and then filler targets from various categories. But you see in our redshift distribution, we're really focusing on cosmic noon sources, sort of redshift two to four, but we have a significant tail uh, to high redshifts with, with very deep spectra as well. So the data looked amazing when they came in. Michael Topping did a brilliant job reducing these. This is just a, a snapshot of several objects that shows you the kind of data we're dealing with. So if you look at some of these star-forming spectra, star-forming galaxy spectra, these really do look like redshift zero spectra. We have dozens of emission lines detected. We detect stellar continuum, you know, spectroscopic detections of Balmer breaks and things like that. We have a few other objects, quiescent, uh, AGN galaxies, as well as very high redshift galaxies. Uh, but it's an amazing data set. And, and the, the wavelength graphs of near spec is pretty incredible. So for these galaxies, we probe essentially from the rest near UV all the way to the rest near infrared with a single instrument. And so that gives us a huge amount of diagnostics we can apply in understanding these galaxies. Uh, so the aurora lines, uh, uh, an initial look at the data indicates we've detected more than 40 O3, 63 aurora lines, more than 30 oxygen 2 aurora lines. So this is really breaking into the regime of a statistical sample of objects at redshift greater than two that have direct method metallicities that can really help us, for example, recalibrate these strong line relations. So at the time left, I just want to highlight uh, one of the objects from our sample that we're going to do some early science on. This is a galaxy at redshift 4.4. Uh, it turns out we actually published a Keck MOSFIRE spectrum of this object in, in 2017. It just happened to make it onto our mask uh, through our selection. Uh, so this is a two-hour Keck MOSFIRE spectrum in the K-band. You can see this, this little blip over here, oxygen 2, neon 3, H gamma. The red line is the noise level. So you can see we're barely able to detect these emission lines above the noise level with two hours on a 10-meter telescope uh, on the ground. And the power of GWC, especially when you go very deep, is quite striking. So this is the same region of the spectrum. Uh, this is 12 hours in the G140M. We have the, the neon oxygen and H gamma lines I just showed. 
Uh, but we detect dozens of other sources, including, for example, auroral sulfur-2, uh, Balmer series lines until we basically run out of being able to distinguish them from the oxygen-2 strong line. And then, of course, we get much more wavelength coverage. So this is the full spectrum probing, again, from carbon-3 in the UV all the way to sulfur-3 in the near-infrared. So an incredible amount of diagnostic power here. And so if we zoom in a little bit, you can see many, many detected faint features, including absorption lines in the UV. We detect more than 70 unique emission and absorption lines in this one source. And with that, you have a huge amount of diagnostic power to understand what's going on in these galaxies. So what can we do? We can take the very many H1 lines that we have, Poshin as well as Balmer series. We can determine the shape of the nebular attenuation curve on an individual galaxy basis. We've done this for this Redshift 4 galaxy, and it deviates significantly from the Milky Way or Calzetti or SMC curves in the rest optical. We see a much steeper curve here uh, that, that is both steeper and, and must have a higher uh, RV as well, even if you set our longest wavelength point to zero in normalization. Um, so, so this is you know, telling us, A, it's not always safe to assume, for example, Milky Way extinction in, in these high redshift galaxies. Uh, it, and, and B, we might have a significant amount of galaxy to galaxy variation. It's something we'll test with the full sample. But with this curve, we can get robust reddening correction uh, for the data on the source. We detect five different optical auroral emission lines for the source. So we can measure electron temperature from doubly and singly ionized oxygen, doubly and singly ionized sulfur, as well as singly ionized nitrogen. Um, and then we can do things like compare the electron temperature in high intermediate and low ionization zones. This is something that Danielle talked about is very important for calculating uh, abundances of low and high ionization potential uh, elements. Um, and, and so I put some points on here as well, some points from the literature. Uh, we have points from templates from Brian Welch. I think he has a poster here on that that you should check out. Also recently published from Noah Rogers from the Cecilia program. Generally, we're finding pretty reasonable results where, where uh, these things are relatively close to a one-to-one, -one, but we'll be able to populate, uh, for example, this diagram with about two dozen galaxies with the full sample. So we hope to understand that better. We can measure ionic abundances for a lot of elements, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, silicon, neon, argon, and carbon. Um, and we get stringent uh, upper limits on some interesting uh, elements as well, like chlorine, for example. Um, and so this, we can really start to probe the abundance patterns that people have analyzed in nearby H2 regions, but we can do this directly at high redshift. So to step through uh, some of these results briefly, um, neon over oxygen, we heard some about this from Danielle. In principle, we should expect this to be completely flat. There is some scatter, um, but high redshift points that have been analyzed, uh, both from Carla here and then our point at redshift 4.4, are relatively close to the solar value, so we're not too far off there. Uh, this is because these are both predominantly produced by uh, core collapse supernovae, which is color-coded blue here. But if we look at other uh, elements, for example, carbon uh, has a significant uh, component from uh, AGB stars at later times. Um, and so we find that this object is pretty enriched in carbon, uh, near solar carbon to oxygen. Uh, but if we compare it to some other objects at high redshift, say at redshift 6 or 8, from earlier published work, we find some objects with very low carbon to oxygen abundances that may indicate very young galaxies that have only experienced enrichment from core collapse supernovae but haven't had the onset of AGB enrichment yet. For nitrogen, we see something fairly similar for this galaxy, a near solar nitrogen to oxygen. But again, nitrogen is weird, it's hard to model, and we, we see points out in this, uh, this space where local points don't really occupy. Relatively low metallicity, but relatively high nitrogen abundance. So we need to understand more of what's going on uh, in reproducing the nitrogen abundances that we observe. And then we have these elements at the end, argon, which, uh, as Chiaki has shown at, at late times, has a fairly significant contribution from type 1a supernovae. You see this gradual climb uh, uh, at, at several giga years. And we find in the high redshift points that actually there is this deficit in argon over oxygen relative to the solar abundance and relative to local H2 regions. And we see the same thing in sulfur that should behave similarly. So we've heard about you know, this evidence for alpha enhancement for an iron deficiency in high redshift galaxies because they have not been enriched by type 1a supernovae due to their young stellar population ages. And this is more evidence for that, I think, from elements like sulfur and argon, which agree better with models that are uh, uh, at ages that are before the type 1a enrichment picks up. 
Uh, so if we look at the total abundance pattern relative to solar, we see that it's enriched in carbon and nitrogen, suggests an age greater than one or 200 mega years because it's AGB enriched, but subsolar in these other elements, which suggests that it has not had significant type 1A enrichment. Now, of course, a single burst model is way too simple. It's not a closed box. It probably didn't form in a single burst. We need to use more sophisticated chemical evolution models in the future, and that's something that we're working towards. Uh, for example, including outflows, which we can measure the outflow properties directly from the same spectra through blue-shifted UV absorption. p signy profiles in the magnesium-2 in absorption and emission, or broad components on the strong lines that have very high signal noise in this data. Um, so this is just an example of how you can get a holistic picture where for individual objects from a single spectrum, you can measure properties covering this entire span to really get a holistic picture of the galaxies that can let us understand the formation processes, the effects of feedback and outflows in these sources. So I'll wrap it up there. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we have time for one or two questions only. Any questions for Brian? Thanks. Um, the attenuation curve that you showed, is that based on measurements of just one galaxy? Uh, yes. So this is measured uh, based on about 12 H1 recombination lines measured in this one single galaxy. I see. And would you expect that to be different if you look at galaxies at different redshifts? Um, honestly, I don't, I'm not familiar with the dust theory, so I can't really say. Um, maybe somebody else can comment uh, more on that. I mean, yeah, please, please. Thank you. I'm not here to answer. I'm here to ask questions. <laughs> so, my question is, uh, what is your color excess on that object? Um, so uh, using this nebular curve, uh, we get an EB minus V gas of about 0.3. So it's definitely not dust free. It has a fair amount of reddening. OK, thank you. Okay, let's thank Ryan again. So our next speaker is Alessandro Marconi, who will talk about accurate metallicities of the ionized gas from low to high redshift with a new approach to photoionization models. No title. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. Sure. Okay, so first of all, before starting, I would like to thank the organizers because this conference is really fantastic. And thank you for the hard work you have been doing. So, uh, I, thanks to the wonderful review by Daniel, thanks Daniel again for what you said before, I don't have to uh, specify how you measure metallicities, but just want to mention that there is also the possibility of using photoionization models, and people have been using photoionization models to measure metallicities. However, there is a discrepancy between what you get from the so-called direct He method and the photoionization <coughs> models. Here are the scale, the mass metallicity relation that you derive from the direct e metallicities and the one that you get from the photoionization model. So where is the discrepancy? Whose fault is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, the photoionization models are generally successful to reproduce the general properties of galaxies. We, they can explain the DPT diagrams, the location of galaxies in these diagrams. However, however, if you look at the single object, they struggle. They, are not able to reproduce very well the emission lines of a single object. And in particular, it is difficult to reproduce the lines uh, from very different ionization stages, like oxygen, uh, neutral oxygen or double ionizing oxygen. 
What is the reason? The reason is maybe it's the physical models, with the physical processes within the photoionization models, or more reasonably, the complexity. Where, where, because when you get a single spectrum of a galaxy, you have the superposition of many spectra of many H2 regions, which are by themselves extremely complex. So this is why we have tried to use a new approach to photoionization models, which starts from the consideration that basically the line luminosity is an integrated quantity. And if you want to get the correct line luminosity, you don't really need to have the correct distribution of gas in the space, but you just have to corre have the correct volume of a given ion, the density and the temperature, regardless of how it is actually spatially distributed. So what you can do, you can get uh, an integral over the, the real distribution in space, or you can just take many different uh, constant density or constant pressure model and combine them with weights, uh, which allows you to reproduce the observations. For people who fit uh, a stellar continua, this is basically the same when you try to explain a stellar spectrum, a stellar continuum of a galaxy by combining different templates and you select uh, the proper weights for the combination. So how does uh, this home run work? Why, well, by chance, uh, we are uh, going to a baseball game, so someone said this is going the first home run you are going to see uh, this afternoon. <laughs> Sorry, this is not the Oriole Park. You can ask me why later. <laughs> OK, uh, so start as an example. Consider, for instance, uh, a high signal to noise H2 region spectrum from the compilation by Zurich et al. Compute cloudy models with the given continua and solar abundance patterns. And then uh, you consider, for instance, this set of emission lines. And you see that here you have uh, five uh, aurora lines. Then uh, you compute uh, a grid of photoionization model in association parameter and density for a given ionizing continuum and metallicity. You combine, you fit uh, only those clouds which are useful to reproduce the observed spectra. So usually it's three, four clouds out of, for instance, 100 or 80. And then you combine the chi-square with your data. And then you repeat uh, overall metallicity to build this uh, chi-square curve, which gives you the best model for uh, a given oxygen abundance. How does it work? Let's make an example. This is one of the H2 region with high signal to noise. The chi-square is so deep that you have uh, to make a plot in logarithmic scale, and it goes way below 1. And uh, this means, uh, given the errors that I have assumed, which are about 10%, uh, that all the lines are reproduced to better than 10%. Uh, here is this diagram, model over observed. The, uh, the gray bar is plus or minus 10%. All these lines, aurora lines, high excitation, low excitation, are reproduced between 10%. By the way, you can also compute the average ionization parameter and density that gives you an information of the average properties of this cloud. But this is what just one object. So we have uh, available the wonderful database prepared by, by Daniel and the Chaos Group. You take, for instance, 22 uh, H2 regions with those with a high signal to noise. You consider a total of 18 emission lines. And as you can see here, you are able to fit uh, all of them to within 10%. And you get uh, a lot of information about this. In particular, you are able to reproduce all the oxygen line, the sulfur-2 and sulfur-3 line, which has always been difficult to reproduce, uh, some, such that some people were mentioning the possibility of wrong atomic parameters. What can you learn? OK, let's do this trick. Let's take uh, the emission lines predicted by the model, apply the TE method, and compare with the TE method applied to observation. And you see that you are perfectly in agreement. But this is just a different way to say that the emission lines predicted by your model reproduce the observation. But if you now compare the uh, TE metallicity from the emission line predicted by the models with the real metallicity predicted by a model, you have a problem because the blue line is the one-to-one -one line and you generally have a discrepancy of about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 dex, but this discrepancy can become even larger. So the, I'm referring now to, metal to the TE method applied to the lines of the, of the model and it should be able to reproduce the metallicity of the model. And this is, in general, not the case. And this is a problem which has been known uh, since, uh, since many years. 
So what can we do with these? We can apply these uh, to uh, galaxy spectra, stacks of galaxies, recalibrate uh, the local uh, strong line diagnostic, uh, compute uh, nitrogen over oxygen or uh, sulfur over oxygen, or uh, we can use it with JWST. Here is the program, Marta, that we have, which is similar to the program that Ryan just presented. We are planning to do the same thing, so I don't have to repeat uh, anything about this. Uh, here is the quality of the spectra. There are many, many auroral lines detected, again, tens of galaxies. And I'm just showing here an example of the application to one of the galaxies. Here are the emission lines which are fit. These large gray bars are just the upper limits. And basically, in all the cases, we are able to reproduce the detected emission lines also by fitting the extinction. But the problem is, this is metallicity predicted by home run, and this is the metallicity that you would get with the TV method. There is a discrepancy of 0.3 dex. This metallicity predicted by on RAM is not uh, well out of uh, the rest of the mass metallicity relation, but uh, you have to take this into account when you're doing uh, T metallicities. Uh, another example, if you apply this method to uh, high Z galaxies, I'll be quick, uh, is that uh, you can uh, estimate, for instance, uh, you can compare these high Z galaxies with what you get with the H2 regions, with the single galaxies, local low uh, metallicity galaxies, and what you get uh, is that uh, high Z galaxies are a bit different uh, from the local one. For instance, you see that, for instance, uh, look at the blue dots. Uh, in terms of ionization parameters, the range, as you can see also here, the range cover of the high Z galaxies is the same. But if you look at the, sorry, but if you look at the densities here, you have a fraction of the object which have very high density. And this is basically consistent with what we heard yesterday from the talks. And this is here. You see that uh, here is the distribution of local galaxies. The high redshift galaxies extend over this range, but there is a significant fraction of objects there. Now, uh, we can apply this also to active galactic nuclei, this method. Just an anticipation, we have developed this uh, kinematical model to try to reproduce uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, to try to reproduce uh, these complex uh, maps that we observe. This is a famous galaxy, NGC 1365, flux velocity and velocity dispersion map. And then with a simple radial outflow, conical radial outflow, our model can basically reproduce the data so, such that it is very difficult to see differences. What can you do from this model? Let's uh, wait for Giovanni Cresci's talk, which will show you what result you can get by combining many galaxies when doing this analysis. Okay, but what you can get, for instance, you can get uh, the mass outflow rate as a function of the radius. Take, for example, the Circinus galaxy. You see this uh, burst in uh, outflow rate, which is, of course, related to the fact that you have here, you have a stronger emission. But is this real? I mean, is this really a bust in mass outflow rate, or is this due to the fact that we are just computing the mass of the outflowing gas with a constant factor? Constant factor based on assumption and based on estimated the density from the source for two lines, which, as people know, is extremely difficult. So what can you do here? You can use OMRAN, because uh, with OMRAN, the photoionization model gives you directly the mass to light ratio, that is the ratio between the mass and the luminosity of the H alpha line. This is, for instance, if you take one blob here, you do the model with all these emission lines, including corona lines and whatever, and this is what you get from the model. Here is instead uh, the, what you assume usually in the literature. You have this dependence from the density, and this factor you see by itself uh, is a difference of factor 10, but you don't know the density because you are not able to measure the sulfur density from the outflowing component, let's assume we get, you use the same density from home run, and what you get, you will get a factor, a conversion factor, which is wrong by a factor 10. So what I mean is that uh, it is important to use this to compute the mass of the ionized gas to deconvolve everything from, uh, the, um, from the ionization effects. So this is my conclusion. Uh, home run, uh, you will see other home runs tonight, uh, is a new approach to photoionization model, which is used combining simple cloud uh, constant density models. 
is able to reproduce all emission lines uh, of the order of 20 emission lines to a level within 10%, uh, simultaneously reproduce auroral lines, lines from different excitations, and allows you to measure basically metallicity, average density, and average ionization parameters, and other things of the gas. And I would like to caution you to the fact that the TE method, the TE method is based on the same equation that goes into a photoionization model. But uh, you are, the TE method is just based on the assumption that density and uh, temperature are constant. And, and that can lead to errors, as people know by, as known since many years, by introducing the T square, the T fluctuations. So then there is the preliminary result from the fact that IZ galaxy are probably a bit different from low Z analog or that you can use, uh, you can apply this uh, also to active galactic nuclei. Thank you. Okay, we have a lot of questions, so uh, I go first there. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, I'm curious, for your, for your grid of models that you're pulling components from, um, the amount of dust in those models and the corresponding depletions, I would naively expect to be a function of ionization parameter. Can you talk about how you handle dust in the multi-component mode? Okay, the dust, uh, we can fit, um, we usually fit models uh, with and without dust separately. Then we take, uh, with different continua, then we take the best models and all the models which are within uh, even uh, difference of the chi-square with the minimum. And uh, there, is no, there are no much differences between uh, we're using either a model dusty model or a model without, uh, without dust, because the, the, the combination of the, of the clouds are different. But the metallicities and the average values are the same. Very nice talk, thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment that in work led by Michaela Hirschman with Stefan Charlot from last year, we came to exactly the same conclusion by convolving cosmological simulations of galaxies with photoionization models, basically the same conclusion that the higher densities at high redshift lead to this change in calibration for the strong lines. So it's nice to come to the same conclusion from different directions. That part of the uh, very interesting model. So I just want to uh, under. So um, the question is: Do you have an intuitive sense of what kind of lines have the most constraining power on the like the multi components? The aurora lines. I mean, uh, <laughs> you need the, the aurora lines to constrain the, the temperatures of the models. Of course, in terms of the distribution. Don't have aurora lines. even one or two are important uh, to, to have reliable results. And so, I mean, uh, even if it's not the direct limit, you still need auroral lines. And, you, and especially for this kind of models, you need a lot of emission lines. You cannot just use two or three emission lines because at that point, it will be completely degenerate. Oh, I think the, maybe that answers some of my questions. So the, I was wondering whether how unique your kind of feeling result to be and also you said that it's more uh, you don't need the distribution but whenever you actually to the last point when you combine with the uh, uh, kinetic modeling do you still need a uh, in that case do you need uh, some distribution you need to assume that each component to be in some velocity component or yeah yeah well that would be the next step uh, would you use I mean the mocha 3d software gives you basically a 3d distribution of the gas uh, so in principle, you could uh, uh, go from a 2D distribution of sky to 3D, but that's still in the future. I mean, we haven't even done any test about that yet. But in principle, that would be the idea of having a three-dimensional BPT diagram and then, of course, applying three-dimensional uh, photoionization model by uh, separating the various parts that you see overlapping on the sky. Last, last question. So, uh, very nice talk. So, uh, concerning the, the thing that it is uh, difficult to reproduce the auroral lines, some of the auroral lines are density dependent. 
So, but in the world with Classy and Star Forming Galaxies, well, the, uh, the world that Matilde uh, did with, uh, with Classy, we see that there is a, a, a gradient because uh, in Aurora Light Line Nitrogen 2, the, dens the critical density of sulfur 2 match, but in other lines, maybe there could be something. I, we did with Matilde uh, a test on a Classy Galaxy and uh, including the optical and the UV lines. Uh, and in that case, all the lines were reproduced perfectly and uh, the abundance was exactly the one written in the paper by Daniel. In the, I mean, the fact that uh, sometimes, uh, <laughs> the fact that sometimes the T emitter does not reproduce uh, the, uh, what you get from the models is not true all the time. It's sometimes it can happen, but other times uh, the T metallicities agree with the photoionization model. So it depends, I mean, on the line ratios. And it's especially true, you have to be careful at high metallicities. Also because there, there could be some uh, oxygen which is in the neutral phase, which of course the T method uh, has difficulties to, to take into account with charge exchanges and, and everything. Okay, let's thank uh, Alessandro again. <laughs> So our next speaker is Ayan Achaya, if I pronounce it well. <laughs> okay, uh, in, he will talk about interpreting gas metallicity gradients on high redshift using cosmological zoom, sim, zooming simulations. Cool, can you guys hear me? Yes. Am I too loud? I usually am. That's <laughs> interesting. All right, great. Uh, we are well into the last hour of what has so far been an exciting and long day, so I will try not to keep you um, for too long. My name is Ayan Acharya. I have been a postdoc here at Johns Hopkins University and Space Telescope Institute working with the Foggy Simulations Group, if you couldn't tell, um, and working on metallicity gradients. Uh, I'm also one of the last frontiers between you and the baseball game, so another reason to not keep you for too long. Uh, therefore, I decided to um, start this talk with my conclusion slide, right? So it's one of the worst ways to start a talk uh, because this plot is, is, looks very messy. And this looks messy, and that has a reason. What this plot is, in one, if, if I want you to take away one thing, one plot from my entire talk, this would be it, right? So this shows the, our current understanding of the metallicity gradient evolution, gas phase metallicity gradient evolution. We have had a lot of talks today from, um, from everyone, uh, basically, about metallicities and spatially resolved metallicities. Um, Grace, uh, Bethan, um, Daniela, they all hinted at how, how metallicity gradients are complex, how galaxies are inhomogeneous, how gradients are difficult to measure. This is all summarized in this plot. The hex bins are observations of various kinds, and these shaded regions are simulations of various kinds. And as you can see, probably, that there is very uh, stark disagreement between the two. And that's one of the key points um, of this talk. Um, so therefore, I could stop here, and I could say my talk has finished. Uh, but I have 10 more minutes. So now I will uh, go on into a little bit of the background. Yeah, metallic evolution is, is indeed a mess right now. All right, so what is metallicity gradient, and why do we care about it? We all know what metals are and what metallicity is, and this is, I think, I believe the third or the fourth time this um, cartoon, really useful cartoon, is being shown, uh, where we see the, a cartoon of the baryon cycle um, of, of metals sort of going in and out from the disk and the, between the disk and the CGM. But what's the metallicity gradient for those who may not be familiar with it? The way we define that is we, we say, okay, there is a certain value of metallicity in the disk of the galaxy at a certain radius um, from the distance. Now, if we fit, and that becomes the radial profile of the metallicity. Now, if we fit uh, a single line through all of these points, the slope of that line is what we call the metallicity gradient. So it's one number, um, and that defines the entire galaxy which is something it may not be the best idea um, to go, go about, but we'll talk about that later. Now, why, does this, why is it important? What physics does it tell us about? So, for example, if the metallicity gradient is negative, if there is high metallicity in the center, less metallicity in the outskirts, that might signal metal pore accretion from, uh, on the outskirts of the disk. Right? That would lead to a negative profile. 
On the other hand, if the metallicity gradient is flat, there is no gradient that might involve um, rapid radial mixing of gas. So that's something that we can tell from an observed metallicity gradient that is flat, for example. Um, something that's been harder to reproduce with models, um, but we have seen in observations, as I just showed you, is positive metallicity gradient. So when I say positive gradient, I mean the center is metal poor and the, the outskirt is metal rich. That might happen when metal enriched gas is kind of falling back, getting recycled back onto the, uh, onto the outskirts of the disk. So clearly, what way the metallicity gradient is can tell us a lot about the underlying physics, about the different gas flows um, between the CGM and the disk. Um, therefore, it is worth taking a detailed look with, uh, uh, with high resolution simulations. And that is what I'll be talking about. That's what I've been doing with the foggy simulation. So just really quickly, very briefly, um, the foggy simulations, if you are not aware of them already, they are a set of six Milky Way-like um, zoom, cosmological zoom-in simulations. Uh, and the, we, the main sort of power of foggy, this is an AMR code, adaptive mesh refinement code, combined with a novel technique called forced refinement, which basically allows us to have very high spatial resolution not only on the co in the cold disk of the galaxy, which um, is, is of course important to have, but also we have very high resolution in the CGM just around the galaxy, right? So that allows us to show, study these small scale, small spatial scale um, sort of gas motions, as well as the fact that we have about five million year um, output cadence of the simulation that allows us to study small time scale variations, as you will see that they're in, uh, important. So what do these metallicity um, distributions actually look like um, in the foggy galaxies? This is just an example. This is a 2D metallicity map, you could say. It's a projected mass-weighted metallicity map. If I took every point on this, um, in this map and plotted it versus the radius, that is what would give me the plot on the, on the right, right? So that's metallicity on the y-axis as a function of radius from the center. The blue histogram is each cell on this left-hand side plot. If I radially bin them, that's the orange plots. If I fit a line to the orange points, that's the, um, that's the sort of the average metallicity profile, and the slope is the metallicity gradient denoted by this orange number. So this is the number that I mean every time I say metallicity gradient. It's important to note that the actual underlying metallicity distribution is not actually always a flat line. In this example, we already see sort of like a, a knee, a break in the radial metallicity profile, and that already is telling us that doing this metallicity gradient um, for, the, for all galaxies is not necessarily capturing all the information that nature is actually offering to us. We are kind of whitewashing um, some of the information. We're losing some of the information. Um, therefore, we have tried to come up with complementary approaches uh, in addition to the gradient um, as to how, how best can we measure this spatially dist spatial distribution of metallicity um, in the gas. One of the ways we have tried is just characterizing the full metallicity distribution, just plotting the histogram of these blue points. That's the blue histogram. And then um, there can be various ways of characterizing a histogram. Uh, one of the super simple, non-parametric way is just to co compute the different percentiles, different statistics, right? And I'll come back to that. This is just one way to quantify the spatial distribution of metallicity. And these are just examples from the foggy simulation, just one snapshot of one foggy halo. Now, how does it look like if we compare this with the sort of the state of the art currently? This is a plot that has been adapted from Wang et al.'s paper in 2022, um, who uh, presented one of the first um, sort of metallicity gradient measurements with JWST. Uh, since then, of course, multiple measurements have been done. I'm sorry I haven't had time to up update the plot with those. Um, but what this shows right now is metallicity gradient as it evolves with redshift, right? So towards the right is the, is the current time. These are just the observations of different kinds from HST, from ones from JWST, ground-based AO, and so on. This is one foggy galaxy, right? How it evolves, how the metallicity gradient of one foggy galaxy evolves with time. Immediately, we can see there's a huge amount of scat, huge amount of stochasticity. That's the first obvious sort of um, science result from our, that we metallicity gradient varies on very short time scales, and therefore, it can be very challenging to interpret high redshift measurements like this, right? We don't know if that's a small instant in, in this kind of weird excursion, or if that's the general um, sort of uh, behavior of that galaxy. If I put the other foggy galaxies on this, this plot becomes truly horrendous, not just visually, but also in terms of, as I said, interpreting, or the chances of interpreting high redshift galaxies. So, 
This is kind of how the foggy metallicity gradients um, compare with the current state of the observations. Okay, so what about the other simulations? What do other cosmological simulation suites predict? Well, if I just convert all the foggy galaxies into this one color, as you can, so you can still see the stochasticity and the variation. And now the other sort of observation, or at least three other simulations, the Illustris, the FIRE, and the MUGS um, simulations with different kind of physics, different numerical approaches, they all um, predict, the, there's one common feature in this, all these simulations, right? And this is the plot that I had showed at the beginning, which is that the metallicity gradients um, predicted by the simulations are predominantly negative. Like almost never there is a positive gradient predicted. Whereas in the observations, it's not just one or two. Like half the time the observations, especially at high redshift, predict or observe positive metallicity gradient. And that's, that's, a, that's a currently an open question. That's a challenge. Um, we don't know what the answer is. Are, is every simulation doing something just very, very wrong? Or are the, are the observations doing something wildly different compared to the simulations? Uh, and that's something we are, you know, I'm sure lots of other groups are also currently trying to find out. All right, now let's very quickly, we'll just go into a bit more detail into trying to understand why this huge stochasticity happens, right? So we'll focus on one foggy galaxy. So this is again metallicity gradient. This time as a function of time instead of redshift. And this is the trace how the gradient evolves. But now there is this shaded region around the, the trace. And that shaded region is basically uh, plus minus 0.03 dex per kpc around the smoothed evolution of this trace. So what that means is, if the trace is outside the shaded region, then a typical observation at high redshift would miss that the general smooth evolution. So for example, if I just happen to observe this point, I would miss that the galaxy just happened to be at this point for a very you know, short duration. So this is just a way of quantifying the stochasticity in the metallicity gradient, the, the, the chances that we might miss the general galaxy evolution picture if we were to observe this galaxy in this area. Uh, speaking of quantifying, in this case, it happens to be about 38%. About 40% of the time, this galaxy is outside one typical observational uncertainty away from its mean behavior. So in other words, if I were to observe this galaxy around redshift 2 or before, um, with a, with a typical um, instrument, there would be a 40% chance that I would miss the typical evolution of this galaxy's gradient. We would get some random excursion um, as, a, as a result. So why does this happen? So let's, let's just compare these two points, which are very closely spaced in time, only 30 million years apart, and let's look at a little bit more closely into what the metallicity profile looks like at point A. This is how it looks like. This, it's flat, almost positive, because of this high metallicity on the outskirts. This, in this case, it could be because of some metal-rich inflows from the CGM. It could be because of interacting systems that were too close, um, and therefore it's kind of biasing the metallicity on the outskirts. And seeming, making it seem like it has a flat or positive metallicity gradients. However, just 30 million years later, it comes, kind of comes back to negative, right? Whereas the histogram doesn't really change that much. So therefore, it seems like the histogram may be an approach that can tell us about, um, that can be more sort of stable and less stochastic. Um, is that really the case, right? Can we really get uh, an idea of stellar feedback um, using this histogram approach? Well, let's find out. So this is something we've already seen. This is the, from the conventional approach, the radial gradient plotted versus time. This is the new approach with what we call the full characterization. I plot here the median, which is the 50th percentile, and the interquartile range of this histogram, again, as a function of time. You know, we get some evolution. We compare that with the star formation history, which in this case we can use as a proxy for, let's say, stellar feedback. And to aid your eye, I'll highlight this couple of places where it seems like every time, or not every time, but sometimes if there is a starburst, ow, okay, uh, sometimes if there is a starburst, um, there seems to be that the median metallicity drops and the interquartile range rises very briefly before coming down, uh, before coming back to their uh, original sort of state, which takes about one or two giga years. Um, so that's what it seems like, and we will do further investigation of this, but I'm happy to talk more about it in details uh, if you would would like to. So just to go back and, and sort of reiterate my conclusions, we studied metallicity gradient evolution with simulated cosmological zoom-in simulations, and we found that they're highly stochastic, particularly at high redshift. Uh, we tried, uh, we're trying a new approach of quantifying the spatial, spatial distribution of metallicity, 
And we think that preliminarily at least, it seems that this new approach is, has a better response to star formation feedback, stellar feedback, than the traditional sort of gradient approach. Um, this paper had just been submitted as of last week, so please feel free to take a look. Um, but yeah, those are my conclusions. Thank you for your time. I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, Ian. Very interesting results from simulations. So we'll pass the microphone there. Okay, so just real quick. So in the nearby, like like very local universe, a lot of galaxies have evidence that the gradient flattens at large radius. And so you know, you, you mentioned that yours flat. I'm just, is there information in the flattening that you can pull out, just like you pull out gradient or or uh, histogram information? Uh, yes, that's a great question, and my short answer would be yes. So in this case, for example, at least in this example, we sort of also see the flattening, right? And we do see that in lots of foggy galaxies in the majority of the time. And in the foggy simulations, we see that because of misalignment between the inner and the outer disk. So actually in this image, this inner disk, which is, as you can see, metal rich, is, has a different sort of um, angle of inclination than the outer disk, which is metal poor. And because of this misalignment, the metal can't travel. And also, I should have mentioned earlier, most star formation is going on in this inner part and not in the outer part, right? So, and with time, we do see, of course, because we have simulation, we ac have access to all the time, we see that with time, as it gets aligned, the metal starts flowing or kind of traveling from the inner disk to the outer and becomes one smooth radial profile. So the flattening, at least in the foggy simulations, implies that there might be some misalignment between the disk or warps in the disk. And that's also something that we're working on currently. But great question, thanks. Oh, it's me. Hello, uh, yeah, interesting stuff. Do, uh, do you, you're just tracking a generalized metallicity here, right? So you're not actually breaking it up by say, iron versus alpha-enriched elements. And so I was thinking if, like, do you, do you think that may be affecting the gradients that you would ultimately produce if you had that ability to actually split by element? Because I, I guess I naively would expect if you're looking at the iron gradient, then you'd, you'd, be, you'd better be able to capture the gradient captured in, that, in the thin extended disk. Whereas if you're just looking at a generalized Z, then it could be hard to separate like the thin disk component versus the thick disk uh, component. So I was just curious if, if that sort of entered into your, your analysis at all. Yes, uh, absolutely. So I agree with your, with your statement, and it's a, very, it's a very good question. So in this case, in this current run of foggy simulations, we, cannot, we do not track the different metal species separately. So in this case, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm just talking about one generalized metal content in the gas cells of the simulation. So this is gas metallicity. But yes, in the observation, typically, um, at least in the high redshift emission line sort of uh, spectroscopy approach, we would have the oxygen abundance as a proxy for metallicity. Uh, but yes, in this case, uh, that, that is not an apples to apples comparison. Again, going back to uh, Daniel's talk, which actually is, is interesting because you know in simulations, again, different simulations have different, have different they track different metal species um, and observations usually do uh, have a proxy for oxygen abundance. So there are differences. So this, this comparison is hard to do. What is interesting, though, is, however, is it's not just a little disagreement, or it's not just one of the simulations that, that doesn't agree. It's interesting because none of the simulations can reproduce positive gradient, no matter what physics they have, no matter what um, metal species or, or uh, ions they, they trace, and no matter what species the observation um, traces as a proxy. So that's the, I think, the key, pro, uh, key takeaway. But yes, I agree. So in the next run of foggy simulations, we are incorporating something that will change the feedback method a little bit, that will track the different species of metals, and that will also trace the metals, and that's something that I'll be working on. So same, same plot, Captain America versus Iron Man, right? Um, the, yeah. There are some... I'll put it there. <laughs> there we go. Um, what can we learn from the galaxies, the few galaxies that do have negative metallicity gradients? That's an excellent question. I've thought about this, and the best I, can, I have been able to come up with is that these galaxies, given the amount of stochasticity that we see, if, uh, you know, assuming that the galaxies in the sky are behaving anywhere remotely close to these, then I would say this is just chance, right? Even this, let's say this observed galaxy right here, you know, this just happened to be here at the time of observations. Like, depends on, depends on where you capture them, I think, in their... What do they look like? I mean, are they really 
uh, they're not disk galaxies. They're not, are, are they in some strange state, state where? Uh, no, I mean, in, in, to the best of my knowledge, the, most of these observations, uh, if not all, are sort of star-forming galaxies, spiral galaxies. Um, I mean, may not be very spiral at high redshift, but they're definitely star-forming galaxies. That's why we have the emission line diagnostics, right? Um, in the simulations, these are definitely all sort of, at least the Fogger simulations, all Milky Way type simulations, or Milky Way-like galaxy at redshift zero. So these are all sort of our standard spiral star-forming galaxies. They don't look very different if you, you know, in, in other ways. It's just that what's going on at the outskirts, if there is an interaction, if there is some gas flow at that specific instant when we are observing the galaxy, that will bias the metallicity gradient greatly. Right. Great, let's thank uh, Ian again. Thank you. So our next speaker is Alex Garcia, who will talk about uh, does the fundamental metallicity relation evolve with redshift? You can turn on the mic. Yeah, man. All right, figured it out. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Garcia. I'm in my third year of my PhD, and I'm actually not from New Jersey. I'm from the other direction. I'm from Virginia, so not too far from here. And uh, my talk today, uh, or excuse me, I should say my research, broadly speaking, is in the physical drivers of galaxy evolution. Now, I'm a simulator as well, and so the way I want to go about answering these questions and addressing these is by trying to make these even-handed and quantitative comparisons between the different evolutionary models, right? This apples-to-apples -apples analogy that we heard earlier. Now, in the year 2024, there's like a million of these things I could pick from, uh, but today I'm going to be focusing on three in specific, that being illustrious, illustrious TNG, and Eagle. Now, I'm not going to have really any time to go into these models in any detail, but I think a fair question one could ask of me is, well, why these three models? And the answer is actually pretty simple. It's because they're actually pretty qualitatively similar. They have runs that are very similar mass resolution, very similar box size, and they implement a lot of the same physics. But on that last point, they don't actually implement the physics in exactly the same way. And so even in these three very similar models, we get a wide diversity of predictions for galaxy properties. This opens up a really interesting area in a super rich parameter space for understanding how changing our galaxy evolutionary models can have profound impacts on how galaxies evolve through time. And today, in specific, I'm gonna talk about one relationship which I think is exceptionally well suited to help me make these quantitative comparisons between these simulation models. That, of course, from the title being the Fundamental Metallicity Relation, or FMR. The FMR is this three-parameter relation between stellar mass, gas phase metallicity, and star formation rate. It's most commonly shown in this mass metallicity relation space, which we've seen a number of times today, as like this gradient here with star formation rate. And this gradient is such that at a fixed mass, galaxies with higher metallicities tend to have lower star formation rates and vice versa. And this has been reparameterized a couple of different ways. And so this Minucci paper changes the x-axis here from mass into some combination of mass and star formation rate with this free parameter here, alpha. Now, what does this alpha do? It takes the value on which all of these star formation rate contours collapse into one relation. And another way you can think about this is it minimizes the scatter. And so we call this value alpha min for minimizing the scatter. Now, really, what this encodes is just tells us how important star formation rate is in setting the scatter about the mass metallicity relation. 
This Minucci paper originally did this with SDSS galaxies, but they also checked it at higher redshift samples. And they find that this same alpha min can describe galaxies out to at least redshift 2.5, earning this relationship its sort of fundamental moniker. But really, the key prediction of the FMR is that the star formation rate of a galaxy regulates its metallicity. If I am a galaxy and I have a high star formation rate, the FMR tells me that I have a relatively low metallicity. This has implications for two features of the mass metallicity relation, one of which being the scatter about it, as I just described, but the second one here being some evolution in the normalization driven by these increased star formation rates further back in time. Now, I mentioned this does pretty well, out to at least redshift 2.5, uh, but I've kind of lied to you a little bit. There's a little bit more here going on. And there's another point on this plot at redshift 3, and yeah, it's pretty systematically offset from the FMR. And if we look at recent JWST observations, we find as we go further back in time, we become more and more offset from this FMR. This has opened up a really interesting question. Does the fundamental metallicity relation evolve with redshift? Now, there certainly seems to be some evidence for this, if you believe observations. But in the spirit of being more quantitative, we need to remember that the FMR tells us about two different things. It tells us about the scatter, about the MZR, but it also tells us about the evolution in the normalization. Therefore, it's possible if one of these things change, that's FMR evolution, or if both of these things change, that's FMR evolution. So as great as it would be to have a yes or no answer to this question, in detail, I think we can all agree, if this answer is yes, we want to know which of these two things is driving that. And so to that end, I'm going to be focusing here on the scatter about the MCR uh, as it changes with redshift. So here is the mass metallicity relation in illustrious, illustrious TNG and Eagle. And these are out to all of the galaxies that we can resolve in this simulation, which happens to be out to redshift 8. And, you know, I could probably give a 10-minute talk on this plot alone, these really interesting comparison. But the thing I want you to take away from here is, one, there is scatter about these relations at all of redshifts. And two, although it's not actually explicitly shown here, the scatter does correlate with star formation rate at each redshift. And so just as Minucci did with their SDSS galaxies, we can find this value that collapses these star formation rate contours onto one relation. We can minimize the scatter with respect to star formation rate. We can calculate this alpha min value for each redshift in each simulation. But we're specifically interested in whether or not this changes with redshift. And so we need to be careful to do this at each redshift individually. And then our guiding question, instead of does the FMR evolve, our guiding question becomes, does this alpha min parameter evolve with redshift? And so let's set up a framework for interpreting our answer. This is a yes or no question. If the answer is no, we have what I'm calling here a strong FMR, which tell, just tells us that the star formation regulation of the scatter about the MZR is fixed with redshift. It's constant. And the op if the opposite's true, if the answer to this question is yes, we have what I'm calling a weak FMR and the star formation regulation changes with redshift. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for here is this alpha min as a function of redshift in illustrious, illustrious TNG and Eagle. And uh, pretty clearly here we can see that yes, the, uh, this alpha min changes as a function of redshift. And so we have to conclude that uh, there is a weak FMR in illustrious, illustrious TNG and Eagle. However, in more detail, if we look at this, it's not the same weak FMR. It's really interesting. This eagle value starts high, right? A lot of star formation rate importance put in eagle at redshift zero, but then it drops off. Illustrious starts low and then gets high. And then TNG does something completely different. It starts low and then sort of spikes up to redshift one and is flat out here. So again, these are three very similar evolutionary models that are making three very, very different predictions. It's really interesting. But uh, you know, taking a step back from that interesting point, we have to ask ourselves, well, what exactly do we mean by weak FMR? What is that exactly doing? So what's going on? So let's like, rebuild up our intuition on exactly how we get this correlated scatter in the first place. So we've got some galaxy sitting out in space at time t is equal to 0, and its mass and metallicity are such that it is exactly on the mass metallicity relation. And I'm going to start my simulation here, and I'm going to start accreting gas onto this. 
which, you know, roughly speaking, uh, uh, means that I'm adding more hydrogen. And so again, hydrogen is fueling new star formation, right? We've heard that a number of times. And if we're thinking in log O over H units, if we increase H, the ratio is going to go down, right? So we've got more star formation rate and a lower metallicity. But new star formation rate also has its own consequences. We're going to eventually deplete the gas reservoir, but these new stars are going to make new metals and return them back into the ISM. So as we're depleting the gas and making more metals, we come back up, we've got a higher star formation, excuse me, a lower star formation rate and a higher metallicity. And this goes around and round. Obviously, this is a simplified picture, just a cartoon. But the end result of this process is that we get this stratified scatter with star formation rate. And the strong FMR, if, if we were to find that, is telling us something uh, really, uh, in my opinion, fundamental, right? Nothing here is tied to redshift is what the strong FMR. If I were to look at a galaxy at redshift 8, this same picture holds as if I were to look at a galaxy at redshift 0. Nothing is changing there. However, the weak FMR is telling us that something is not, or something is tied to redshift here. In the simulations, something about this picture is inherently tied to the redshift at which you look at. And that's what the weak FMR is telling us. In more detail, what is that thing that's changing with redshift? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? I, I don't have a good answer for you yet, but stay tuned. This is something that we're looking into actively right now. But the key takeaway I want to uh, give here is that we have this metric to quantitatively compare these very similar models, and it produces a result uh, that is very different in these three models. And so I return to this, this question of the talk, does the FMR evolve? I'm going to actually implore that we don't ask this specific question. Again, because there's two features of the FMR. One of them could be changing, the other one could be changing, they could both be changing. We need to ask a more specific question. And I'm advocating that we instead ask, is the FMR strong or weak, as I've outlined here? And in the simulations, we find that we have a weak FMR, which tells us something really interesting about the evolutionary models that we can hope to constrain in the future. And furthermore, this has not yet been tested observationally, but this is something that could be tested observationally that could really help us out in our future models. And so with that, I'll leave up my summary and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. We have time for a couple of questions. <clears throat> Hi. But isn't the question what's different in these models? The physics that's different in these models, right? This uses the same, uh, you know, if you apply these models to the same data, you get different results, <laughs> uh, if I understand correctly. Yeah, yeah, certainly, yeah, yeah. So that's the first question, right? What's different about how the models are calculating that? Yeah, certainly, yeah, 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 and, and yeah. Yeah, so there are a number of differences between the models. Um, and a lot of them are, are like very detailed implementations. Um, and so, for example, like the, the illustrious and illustrious TNG use some effective equation of state to handle the star forming ISM, whereas Eagle uses a completely different equation of state, right? And they're qualitatively, they're similar, but in, in detail, there are differences. Yeah, just one example. Hey, Alex. Uh, super interesting talk. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you've looked into, in the simulation, instead of the, the star formation rate based FFR, FMR, the gas mass or gas fraction base, because the response of the star formation rate and the metallicity are really both responses to changes in the gas mass or gas fraction of the galaxy, and that should be a more fundamental relation. Now, the observational constraints are much worse for that, but there is some evidence at redshift zero that that's a more fundamental relation. So do, have you looked into whether you have this weak or strong uh, FMR situation if you base it on the gas content of the galaxy rather than the star formation rate as the third parameter? We have not explicitly looked at this with star uh, with gas fractions or, or gas masses, um, but in principle that's a very simple test to do. So it's something we should do, I think. Yeah. So this might be a related question. A while ago when people were looking at the mass metallicity relation, it seemed that if you were to separate galaxies based on their morphology, those that are regular disk galaxies from those that are interacting, right? They have, the ones that are interacting have larger scatter. 
So my questions are uh, whether or not you know that's been updated since the 15 years that it was published, and then you know there were a bunch of papers, and whether or not you're going to have changes if, in the fMR if you have an increasing fraction of interacting galaxies as a function of redshift. Yeah, so to answer your question, your first question, yes, I think Sarah Ellison is on a couple of papers that look at this fMR in interacting galaxies. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but I'm pretty sure that they find that there's not an fMR. It doesn't follow the traditional fMR. So qualitatively, the galaxy mergers do the same thing that the fMR does. They have high star formation rates and low metallicity. But quantitatively, they don't sit on it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in, in part B of the question is that, you know, if you have uh, increasing, fraction, you have an increasing fraction of interacting galaxies, if you're already showing that they don't sit on the fMR, that could induce this change. Okay, we need to move on to Last the yeah. discussion now. Uh, let's thank Alex and all our speakers of this session. <laughs>
must be someone's answer to one. Oh, so can we show what the first question is? Yes. No. Pause. This was the question. If you can know all things, unlimited knowledge, which single element do you think will tell you the answer to the life and the universe and everything? I knew someone was going to put gold. <laughs> Or absorption lines, love to see them. Are, are there gold lines in stars? In the near, on the four stars, I thought. Four stars. Four. 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 So we'll start with our theorist, Chiaki. What do you what do you take away from this? I think it's on. Yeah, I, I should I should I just give the just come what's into your head? Well I, I typed actually I am. The reason is it says all of the star formation. So it shouldn't include binaries as well. That's the reason. A ball observer? And then we can go to the audience. Do you agree with the word map? No. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a good question. Why not? I mean, I'm usually trying to think of like, what can we measure everywhere? And we try to do this with oxygen. It's really, really hard. I, th I think mine is carbon which I didn't talk about at all today, which is, so. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they want to, an argument they want to add? This is just a warm up or? It's a warm up. It's far more provocative. You know what I had to do in my class the other day when I was teaching? I learned um, vote with your feet. Have you, have you ever done that before? No. Where you make everybody get up and go to different corners of the room to vote? Oh my gosh. Don't, don't make us do that, it was painful. Yeah. It was painful. Dark model, or dark matter. Oh, yeah. Okay, should we move to the next question? Mm. This one? Yep. This is a multiple choice question. Oh. We've heard a lot today about G and Z11 and many other. Disruption. We're getting good participation on this question. It's great, yeah. Then we all have an opinion. I know that you have some strong opinions on. <laughs> I know, but we want to hear more things from other people. Does anyone want to share their uh, argument for very massive stars? You're obviously in a nice majority here, it's a safe space. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uncertainties in the UV uh, nebular diagnostics for sure. Um, I am super interested in you know some of these predictions of very massive stars, but I remember I learned from reading Chiaki's paper that they're super super uncertain uh, when when we're talking about like the stars that are like you know 
a thousand, ten thousand solar masses, like not just above a hundred, the ones that are like incredibly massive that we think, you know, there's not enough metals to really cool things sufficient. There's no metals uh, to cool things uh, at all at high redshift. So we get these like, you know, different clumping mechanisms that we produce these very massive stars. We don't really have any idea what their um, nucleus nucleosynthetic productions are. Um, they're super uncertain. But it's enticing. I don't know. Does anyone want to comment on why they don't think it's supermassive black holes? Because we hear a lot about this in other conferences that they do think it's supermassive black holes. Why are we not thinking like that? Sean, you want to comment? You want to go back there too? Um, We're here as well. Go ahead. You can use me first. The region angle is hard, right? Because at least with the, the redshift to our galaxy, when you do the UV line diagnostics and stuff, it becomes really hard to disentangle. And then it still, all the models that we have still favors like a star forming solution. So, I mean, it can also be in accurate calibrations, as you say. But um, because you still see the bow and radiation and stuff, which is typically seen in AGN at low redshift, but you can also do that with like very massive stars, which will give like a strong nebula continuum. So, I mean, it's all, these all degenerate, right? But the problem is, how do you make high NO, but then also have super solar, no, sub solar carbon to oxygen, right? So it's like this carbon to nitrogen thing is probably the key thing, I think, which we have to understand properly. Is, uh, that's what I think, at least. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Naya. I think the answer is none of these. <laughs> none of the above. Okay. And the reason I say that is because I think, it depends what you mean by high redshift and what metallicity you're talking about, but I think you can produce a high N to O ratio just by rotating O stars, which don't have to be very massive, because if they're rotating, then the CNO, um, materials in the center get um, just move up to the surface and then with the stellar wind um, the enhanced nitrogen is just lost and because the first part of the CNO cycle is carbon to nitrogen so the, so the carbon goes down mm -hmm. so unless you have some really I don't know zero metallicity star at high redshift or something then you're going to see it in I don't know, all the stars that are, say, more massive than, I don't know, 50 solar masses or something. But we could be in the last of them. But it's not. Well, all right. Yeah, yeah but, but wolf, wolf ray stars are not on the main sequence. I'm talking about just normal common or garden O stars that rotate. Any more comments? Or do you want to move on to the next one? Carla. OK, so yeah, I think my, my thoughts about nitrogen overall are very high riches. It's also in different cosmic epochs. It's like uh, we are based on our observations in the optical, basically only nitrogen too. But also there is other emission, other nitrogen lights that are not available or they are not useful for tracing nitrogen overall. We just recently see observation for nitrogen three, nitrogen four, and I don't know if there are people working in to know if really these lines can be useful for determine these uh, abundances, or they are tracing another kind of region of the, of the gas. This is my guess. And also well to understand how this nucleosynthesis, I think the, they're missing a point. <laughs> they're also about the nucleosynthesis so all different uh, stars not to understand. I think the stellar people is working on, on that. Thank you. I think something I was also wondering as, as I've been thinking about this and talking to various people about this is um, when I, some of these very high redshift objects, you know, like GNZ 11's at, you know, redshift 10.6, and there's another one that was discovered at almost redshift 12. Um, they have these incredibly high densities, right? Like higher than 10 to the six that they're getting from these, these regions anyways, the very high ionization regions, which seem like they're AGN. And so can, you know, is that, a, is that a useful comparison? Are we doing like AGN abundances in a comparable way as we're doing our normal H2 region abundances? 
I don't know. Nitrogen abundance should be high, even if it's ADN. Maybe not that high, but uh, it should be higher than the solar radiation. Yeah. And also, uh, in, in these different uh, papers that show nitrogen overall, I think they are, con are very coincident and had a flat, a different weight of metallicity. Nitrogen overall is very high, which is a bit flat. I, there is no more than that. It's like uh, every 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 single galaxy is flat. I don't know if this means something. Yeah. So maybe we're like we're catching a unique phase, a unique process, because it's always at this kind of similar limit. Yeah, always within the same range. So we're gonna have one more question, which is along the high redshift um, thread. And that's how high, and this is, you can answer more than one box for this to constrain yourself. But how high of a redshift do you think we've constrained chemical evolution? It looks like we're actually very comfortable in the up to redshift three then. People but then it drops but drastically. It drops massively. <laughs> why? Why why do you not click higher than redshift three? Okay. Samples aren't big enough. Okay. We haven't gone down to low enough mass. Yeah, we're only seeing like the brightest things, right? Biggest, brightest things. Do you want to talk more? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, as somebody who doesn't do chemical abundances that much, I'm curious as to why there isn't a Z greater than a thousand on here, because Primordial abundances are a thing, and we should actually care about them, right? So, I mean, yeah, we had the CMB, we've done a lot of stuff. It's Yeah. And to be fair, like our primordial helium abundance is, is pretty well constrained, to be fair. <laughs> I actually feel pretty good about that one. It might be a question for Chiaki because I, I think when you go to the, these very low metallicities and very high masses, this pair instability, supernova, and hypernova and stuff gets possibly more important. So I don't know what your opinions are on how accurate these models are because that's probably how the metals are being made, right? Oh, accurate. Well, I'm doing my best, but uh, still, it's uncertain. Uh, but the good thing is uh, nuclear sensor use can be calibrated by local stars, nearby stars in the, in the Milky Way. So if we assume the same physics should be the same, IMF, we have to assume something, and then after that, the prediction at high, for high red galaxies are uh, calibrated already by Milky Way. But if you think I am a different, the story also can be different. I think we're ended there. Five yeah, we need to release you to the baseball. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to carry it. This is part one of this discussion. We're going to continue it tomorrow with more Slido questions. Um, thank you to our observers and our theorists for helping us with this discussion. Um, give them a round of applause. You did great. <laughs> and you too. Thank you for participating. Matilda and Darshan, do you have some logistic stuff you want to announce?
I think that the only thing I have to say, I wrote it also on Slack, but if you, if you have a physical poster, you can bring it tomorrow, and we can leave them on the entire week because we don't have too many. So please bring your physical poster. To all the people who have physical posters, bring them tomorrow, and people who have them on, just let, let them on. <laughs> okay? This is it. Thank you very much. Yeah. You can, you can keep it the entire week. <laughs>